my name is Ricardo Badalone. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Diablo Technologies. I just want to thank uh, Stephen and the group for having us here today. It's an honor to be presenting and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. I encourage uh, people that have questions to just interrupt me and ask. I, I enjoy that. It loosens me up, makes me less nervous. So, uh, and it makes it more interesting. So if you've got any question at all, just go ahead and chime in and we'll deal with it on the spot, okay? Okay, so I'm here today with Maher Amer, our CTO, and Kevin Wagner, our VP of Marketing. I'll be doing most of the, uh, of the speaking, but we'll interleave the two guys as necessary throughout the discussion. I'm reasonably technical, so should be able to answer most of the questions, but if, if not, I have my wingman to back me up. Okay, so a little bit about Diablo. Uh, we're based in Ottawa, Canada, so we're a Canadian company. Um, we obviously have been uh, focused very heavily in the last two, three years on something called memory channel storage, um, which is a, essentially leveraging the memory subsystem of the processor to uh, accelerate applications via non-volatile non memory uh, storage. Not necessarily just flash, it could be could be anything. It's an abstract layer that we've invented. Uh, we're, a, we're a startup, so we're a VC-backed company, uh, very strong investor base, uh, international, uh, West Coast, uh, East Coast, Boston-based, Europe, Israel, and also some key strategic uh, investment from uh, some storage vendors that is not necessarily public. So uh, lots of very strong breadth of investment in the company, and of course, uh, you know, some also very important partners that we've been leveraging to build the MCS ecosystem. It, it is an ecosystem, right? What we're doing is we're tapping into a very um, uh, obscure resource of the processor, right? Which is the memory subsystem typically buried, you know, <coughs> very deep within the server and not necessarily accessed like a typical I.O. interface. Right? PCI is a peripheral component interface. It's designed uh, to handle lots of different types of, of cards and applications. The memory subsystem is very specific, very unique, and typically only uh, the operating system and the applications get access to it. And so the infrastructure that's required you know, to put something, let's call it foreign, in that, in that subsystem is a little bit, uh, you know, it's, be, it's being done for the first time. And as a result, we need that ecosystem to be built. And obviously it's one of Maher's key, key strengths is that he manages the team that literally does the integration along with the servers. Going forward, you know, we're looking to essentially have that more mainstream and be able to have this technology essentially plug and play. That's the goal, okay? Uh, in terms of some of the partnerships that have been announced, you know, obviously, one of the very important partners of the, of the uh, technologies from a system integration perspective and a software uh, integration perspective has been IBM. A uh, very important partner to Diablo and uh, an amazing company to work with. Also, uh, SanDisk, which uh, as I understand, uh, you know, was here yesterday and was very well received. You know, also an extremely good partner, uh, amazing technology, amazing people and uh, we have a great working relationship with them and a lot of mutual respect. Very synergistic uh, in many ways and hopefully the presentation today complements what was presented yesterday and, and also the, you know, the strength of the partnership hopefully comes through uh, as we talk. At the ISV uh, level, uh, also you know, VMware, very important partner. Virtualization is a key market segment that we're going after with this technology and you know, I've heard the term, it's a, it's a niche technology brought up, you know, several times. Um, I think that's a very defensive reaction. Hopefully today, when, as we talk about it, you'll see that the potential for this technology is so broad. Uh, and that's why we're excited about it, frankly. And, and that's really why it's so important and why you're hearing about it so, so do, you know, predominantly uh, in, this week. Um, you know, the other thing is we've, we've been in this space for a long time. Uh, we've been in the memory subsystem space for a decade as a company, um, you know, Maher being one of the early uh, architects of some of the early chips that we designed that, you know, literally sat between processors and memory, that's our game. Bolting onto the processor memory subsystem and abstracting what's behind it. Uh, and in effect, fooling the processor into thinking it's talking to memory when in fact it's talking to something else. That's our strength and that's why we were able to 
to succeed in it, not only implementing, but also bringing this technology in a commercialized fashion to the industry this year. Okay? Any questions so far? Well, yeah. IBM and Sandisk are hardware partners, so VMware is just, in my opinion, an, uh, um, a, a software partner that utilizes uh, flash storage. So why is VMware so important uh, to you? So they're not just doing software. They are the, so the manner in which an application, or in this case, a hypervisor that leverages the storage stack, the manner in which it takes advantage of a, of a flash store is actually the, the most disruptive part of the technology and frankly the thing that will change the most in the next five to ten years. What we've done is we've, we've brought a, a hardware and firmware and software platform to bear that actually presents you know, a, a huge pool of non-volatile data that can be swapped in and out with, with actual pages of RAM, you know, lightning fast. Yeah, but does, doesn't the, the hardware take, take care of that? But to be able to take advantage of it at the application layer, the piece in between, which is the operating system, mm -hmm. that's the piece that actually is exercising the swapping of the pages. Okay. And, and actually, the VMware stack is pretty complex. And it, it's the last one that typically you get to market because it's not straightforward. Uh, and the other thing about virtualization is this is an enterprise application. People are, you know, a, a bank is running their IT infrastructure. Your your money, your investments, your data on that. It's very important that it operate at an enterprise grade, and of course VMware is very famous for that. So VMware is an important partner because they, the enablement for that hypervisor is not as straightforward as you think. And so getting their certification for somebody like a Bank of America or something like that is extremely important, and that's why it, it was a big investment to get their buy-in, and it's very difficult to actually get their, their, their buy-in, okay? Yeah, I'd, I'll take Rob, uh, what Rob said. Um, I'll take it. You, you want to do the same thing with, uh, with, the, uh, with Microsoft? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, the goal is to have that type of relationship. This is an example of us starting to build out the, the ecosystem. And uh, definitely Microsoft is a very important operating system and they are also a very important uh, software provider at the application level. And it's no secret that they're looking at ways of accelerating their applications, particularly database using Flash. And that's a big focus for us that we'll get to towards the, uh, the end. Very good point. Anything else? Okay, good. Okay, so on that note, um, you know, we're going to get pretty technical today. And so hopefully that will bring out more about how it works and why it's fast and what is exactly fast about it. But, you know, for, as a company trying to build a business, you have to be really clear about what is it that you want to achieve. And the goal that we have for this technology, <coughs> broad-based application acceleration. All right, what we really do is we work very hard to understand how can we translate the performance of the subsystem into the application efficiency, mm. scalability, something that somebody can monetize or something that can translate into a very specific economic benefit for a user. So we spend a lot of time as a company, you know, we are a component company to some degree, but we spend a lot of our time, Maher spends a lot of his time and he has a team of solutions engineers that spend their time working with the people that build the applications and more importantly deploy the applications and you know it's it's going to be a bit of a wave in the next six months where early on you saw a lot of talk about hey low latency applications like wall, wall street electronic trading here's how we can change the game in terms of performance there but we're going to start moving as you've seen you know perhaps at Parcona live three or four weeks ago where MySQL, which is a mainstream uh, open source database where we were you know, massively accelerating that and essentially taking the software to its limit. And now Procona is revisiting their software because they are now the bottleneck. And that's kind of the strategy that we took where today we're coming in as a certain type of device that you can access. 
tomorrow as the application essentially becomes the bottleneck, it will have to change how it accesses us as a technology. And that was my point also about VMware. We have made them the bottleneck. They can now in turn go and say, okay, where can I optimize my stack? And frankly, I don't really want to use it as storage, really. I want to use it as an accelerator. So I'm going to access it completely differently going forward. I mean, this is what you call evolution, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and so initially, the idea here is that it drops in and accelerates all these applications essentially as an extremely lightning fast storage device. But going forward, we'll talk a little bit about how it's not going to really be a storage type play going forward. It's going to be evolving to cache line acceleration at the application level. And that's for us the exciting piece. So, you know, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, how we've got specific acceleration in some of these spaces. Yeah, we I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Are you meaning that you are working on a, a, a RDMA access to, to the device? Or? Sorry, I can't uh, make out the question. Are you meaning that uh, you are working on uh, RDMA access to the DIM or so our memory? RDMA basically means you know moving a page of memory or a cache line of memory into another remote cache line of memory. There's no question that our protocol can natively support RDMA from device to device within the memory subsystem. That is just one aspect of the type of software acceleration that we will bring to market in the next 12 to 18 months. So the device literally does sit in the memory subsystem. It's mapped in as memory. And as a result, you can DMA from one buffer to another buffer in the device by using strictly RDMA. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but, uh, uh, but the, the, the question is, how does the application leverage that? Yeah. But from a can that be done, it is already possible today. Yeah, but it's page map into the memory space, but you've actually got a lot more uh, memory <coughs> behind it and stuff like that. Can they access that? I mean, yes. through RDMA and stuff like that? Yes. You can access what we call host-facing buffers, which are actually accessed by the memory controller, like DRAM. They are accessed real-time as DRAM. So those host-facing buffers both right... Yeah, but it's not just the host-facing buffers, but the backing store that you have... You know, in the case of uh, SanDisk, it's, you know, 200 gig SSD or something like yeah. that. That would uh, be nice to be able to access the 200 gig directly through RDMA. Uh, okay, so the question becomes, what do you want to do with it? If you want to read, read from it, you have to move it out of the media, and then you can RDMA it from one memory page into another. Yeah, but I, but if you want to write I wanna, it into the I wanna media... Use that, I want to use that 400 gig to run HANA. I, w I, I want it to be memory. You can eventually get it to be memory. You can write to it like memory. And later on, we will potentially, using concepts similar to prefetching in an operating system, you can potentially page stuff in without actually stalling or faulting the application. Mm. So in that case, when you build an application that says, OK, I have a data set that's in memory, if it understands what is in which tier of memory, it can potentially operate without faulting. And that is what we're looking to prove this year. So that would, in effect, if you had a hybrid memory subsystem where you had 200 gig of, of RAM and three terabytes of flash, yep, just, that just would like look when potentially was, just like, when I was like in it was running out three gigabyte, two terabytes of flash. <laughs> That's the goal. The, yeah. the goal is to not make the application fault, meaning I, it's not a swap. And then it looks like, for example, an in-memory database is essentially using all two terabytes of data. Right? So that is what we're working on right now. As a first step, we're not there, but that doesn't mean that it can't be supported by the architecture. You really need the application to know what's where yeah, to be and, able to manage that. And right? I'm having a little bit of trouble with tents because yesterday we heard what's shipping. Yep. And you're talking about things that they weren't talking about as being shipping in yep. the present tense, okay, so. which seems to me would should be in the future tense. Well, they're not building the hardware per se. Yeah. Right, but when they're he says you can, yeah, the then I got to be able there. to buy that from somebody. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about what we have today. Yep. Okay. What we have today is we have a block interface. Now, somebody asked me, "Hey, can I use this, you know, to run an application on it?" I was trying to answer the question. So the answer is you will be able to. 
right? Will. As it is, right. as it I is have today, no problem with the answers. It's just kind of like what's in present and what's in future. Right. Yeah. So today, not currently able to. Today, it's a block interface, and we did that for a reason, right? We didn't want the operating system and the application to have to change to take advantage of the performance we had, mm -hmm. okay? And so really the way it works is that there's no application change, no operating system change. So, uh, and the functionality essentially is replacing existing solutions, okay? Um, the block interface is essentially, uh, you know, called different things. Could be presenting itself as a SCSI target, let's say in VMware or Windows. In Linux, it's block, but it kind of all means the same thing. Yeah, it's An application has data that it wants to persist. Right. It's sitting in pages of memory, and we copy it from those pages into another page, and then say, "Hey, the write is complete, or the read is complete. Here's the data." All right. So this is what we have today. Now, the hardware that's underneath, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is actually doing operations at a cache line level. Right, so we are moving cache lines of memory from one memory page uh, location, physical memory page location, to another physical location, which is our, our silicon. But it's all mapped in the memory. So that actually allows you to potentially go forward and bring more functionality to the market, which is what we, where we want to go tomorrow, right? By persisting the cache lines, right? Uh, we want applications to be optimized to leverage MCS, okay? And that opens up new usage models. Uh, why is that important? Give me an example. Well, for, for example, the in-memory database, yeah. right? That is a big wave now coming in, real-time analytics. I want the entire database compressed into a memory data set and I want to be able to read it, write it, analyze it in its compressed form, you know, something like SAP HANA. Well, the interesting thing is, can we take the performance of the memory subsystem and the capacity and density of the flash and combine them, mm -hmm. right? And so when an application or a database dirties a cache line, you would love to have that automatically persisted in flash and not have to log it essentially sync it with the database. We're talking about a real, you know, multi-terabyte in-memory database that is real-time <coughs> a hybrid subsystem. And that's where, you know, this is the type of stuff that we want to look to improve and bring software APIs for the in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay. So, you know, would, for us, would that, Diablo, would that Ultra, go, would that, Are you planning to go so far as to include atomic rights? Absolutely, no question about it. Already today, atomic rights are possible. Right? And that's because everything can essentially be constructed and owned by the driver. The commit piece of it, the atomic portion of it, is when is the application told and how do we guarantee that a certain number of you know, blocks or a certain size of block is committed at some atomic level. And we can scale that essentially to any size we want because of the parallelism of the architecture. So sub 4K transactions is one class. Uh, atomic across a certain block size is another class, right? right? Absolutely, that, that is definitely feasible. But you know, SanDisk has a certain view. They're bringing a product to market. For us, memory channel storage is, a, is an architecture, right? What we're looking to do is expand beyond just using it as an SSD. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it different about everything, uh, right. than everything else. And that's the reason why we're talking about today and tomorrow. So what's missing to some extent is the, is the the partnership with SAP or some of the other you know, in-memory database players that could modify their applications to take advantage of this. Yep. I mean, you know. Well, it's not announced, right? Yeah. But it doesn't mean that they're not in development. Okay. Right? okay. Uh, and that's why I said this is something Maybe you need to Intel. prove with the application developer. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 To, to some, Yeah. To some extent, we have to return to yep. what we had 50 years ago with where <laughs> memory in a system could be different speeds. And applications, well, the, know about and it. applications were aware of it, yeah. Uh, exactly, exactly. And, and I think that, that people want that, you know, because this is going to drive a huge amount of acceleration and consolidation oh. simultaneously. Yeah, right? and I think that's the, the power of it. What's the advantage that, that that brings to the table? If it does indeed accelerate, you know, that's 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 Accelerate something. and consolidate, that's the power. In other words, get more work done out of less infrastructure. 
right? And essentially, you don't want, you can already get more work done uh, in less infrastructure, but the efficiency isn't there. Virtualization can drive consolidation, but it doesn't mean you get more work done in that infrastructure. Okay. Okay. So, by the way, any more questions about uh, anything I've covered so far? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how it works. So what's different about memory channel storage is that everything is fully contained within the memory subsystem of the processor. And beyond that, there are several memory subsystems of each individual physical processor that are connected through something called a, a NUMA architecture, so non-uniform memory access. So if you imagine a two-socket server has two processors, each physical processor has a certain number of cores and a certain number of physical memory channels. In this case, uh, today, a Sandy Bridge processor has four physical channels. So when you have two processors, you have eight channels that are kind of operating in parallel. Each core essentially can access you know, any data or any cache on those two processors. So the caches are coherent. Everything is essentially connected. And of course, that extends to four socket and eight socket architectures that are more in the EX uh, type uh, category, which we support, obviously. So really what you're looking at is any application or any core uh, sees a, a memory subsystem that can be accessed through you know, n number of parallel memory channels. And so unlike the I.O. approach, right, where I, I've seen people come in here and say, hey, we can get you know, five terabytes of flash on one card, we have literally the exact opposite as a strategy. To get the performance, what we want is for a smaller resolution to be distributed in, you know, in n numbers and operate in parallel across as many memory channels as possible. Exactly like the memory subsystem today. You know, the example that I usually give is if somebody wanted 256 gig of RAM in the system, they don't try to build a 256 gig card. Yeah. They break it up into whatever gigabytes per memory stick makes sense for them. Right, depending on the speed, depending on the cost that they want, and they put as many of them as they can in parallel, because that's how they get the performance. Okay, so coming from the memory world, everything for us is about concurrency and parallel, parallel operations. So what you do, the way it works is you say, okay, this is how much flash I need, and you divide it down by the maximum number of modules that you can support, and then you spread that out over n number of memory channels. Okay, so that's you know, the con difference in concept number one. You know, we're all about parallelism. We're not about consolidation. And of course, we're getting in a two-socket server now, you know, you can get up to six, six seven <coughs> terabytes of flash with the 400 gig modules from SanDisk, tons of memory slots, tons of capacity, you know, easily scale up to multiple terabytes, even in a blade. So, so Ricardo, yeah. what's, the, what's the advantage of not using, like, the block interface today? I mean. The numbers they were, were throwing out like yesterday, seven microsecond latencies. I mean, if you decide not to use That's block and just use the regular expanded memory environment, I mean, what would be the advantage? How fast, how much faster would it be? Okay. <coughs> the answer is significantly faster. How much significantly faster than seven microseconds well, is like let's, zero let's, or something like on, that? Hold on, hold on. Or five or four. No, There's a lot no. of numbers in there. Significantly is like, <laughs> Ray, maybe your data shows By up the way, ahead of time and it's negative. Data, the way, data shows up ahead of time, it's good. I like that because you're like, God, you're so fast already. Just give up. Leave it alone, right? You're well, done. You know, I, it, so, you're, no, no, it's good. Seven good. microseconds is, is the device latency. That's not... So. The that's not the latency the application sees. If you remember, no, Andy it's the application. That's the application. Oh, it is. Through, to a, access through a, a block. File, through a file system, you can you can get that that type of latency. It's extremely Seven microsecond fast. latency. Remember, it's extremely fast. That it's just a mem copy. And that's just all right. Copying <laughs> yeah, memory but, from but one flash. One but, also, to but also remember, I'm going to let him present instead of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also remember, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 oh, no. I, I, I'm just going to shut up and let him. But also remember, Andy Warfield at last storage field day talking about how the limiting factor in talking even to the PCIe SSD is process. was the, the Linux block stack. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if we're talking to memory, we eliminate you know, 10,000 lines of code for every write. Yeah. There's, there's two reasons. Oh, so I'm <laughs> gonna, I actually want to answer your question, believe it or not. 
Uh, but there's two reasons why it's very fast. First of all, the, the, the actual driver is really an application. Okay, and I've got that coming on. I'll let, I'll let Mar explain how, how it works. But really, because everything is in the memory subsystem, imagine an application. It wants to add two numbers. Well, what does it do? It reads two pieces of data, does uh, some type of ALU uh, thing, and then it writes it back, right? So what do we do? For us to write is we read from memory, we write it back. Okay, so really, our driver is a very, very thin application that's running at a certain point in the stack. So it's extremely low latency compared to you know, other type drivers that are doing you know, maybe storage related things and taking a little longer, setting up DMAs. It doesn't really work that way and it's very fast. So through the stack and the hardware, of course, is extremely fast. So that whole thing is very thin. And so you're really talking about a couple of microseconds effectively added to what the Linux operating stack real latency is, which we call SLAT or the system latency. And so if you have an efficient file system, it will actually see a very low latency uh, even down to the hardware. Now your question was more, well, why would you want to go faster? Well, it isn't a question about going faster. It's about allowing the application as it's real time, dirtying cache lines and changing pages to have it automatically persisted, right? So think about, um, you know, we've been called an NVDIM in the past. We're not an NVDIM. We are a flash DIM or we're something different. But an NVDIM is a DRAM module that when power is interrupted, it destages its data to flash. We are an all flash device. Now having an all flash device where an application thread can write to memory as fast as it wants and it auto magically has every cache line written into a flash, potentially even re replicated, knowing the data will never disappear. That's why we want to be able to do it that fast. Because think of an in-memory database that has a data set or a real-time messaging platform that's coming in absorbing millions of transactions per second, millions. To be able to keep up with it, you have to be all in RAM. Well, if you're all in RAM, but magically persisted when that system goes down, every cache line has been written and stored and replicated. That's very powerful. You can not do that today, but that's where we want to get. So if you want, we got to be in the hundreds of nanoseconds per cache line to get that but you throughput. Can't get that, you can't get that sort of time frame on the back end flash. So leave that to us. There's right? some buffering that You'd has to be, go on. Of here course there's it. buffering, but you can get, we already today can get gigabytes per second of throughput. We have systems where we've hit 20 gigabyte per second. That is the equivalent of two memory channels operating at full throttle, 100%. So we're going to be bringing out some crazy performance numbers, but this is the magic of, you know, that Diablo's bringing to the table. That's our piece that we're bringing. You know, Sandus brings the NAND, the Guardian. We allow the application to leverage that NAND at those types of throughput, right? And what we want to do is we want the application thread to never stall, right? That's what I said before. And if it doesn't stall, it's because it can essentially complete every transaction as if it was completing it into the cache. So that's why we want to drive it down to, frankly, sub one microsecond. And we will get there, right? We have prototypes already today that actually can prove that on our existing hardware. And then going forward, you start bringing in hardware assist it's a completely different game. So today, five microseconds or seven microseconds, whatever it is that they said, because uh, it, it, it also depends, is of course extremely fast. But we will be better, significantly better. And it's just step one of many steps of the evolution of this technology.